well, it has been a while. I'm back in Michigan now, had spent the past two months out west in Idaho and Montana, but because of that, I've done a horrible job of keeping up on these videos, so I apologize for that, but things are gonna get better. I'm in Michigan now, hunting season's quickly approaching, so there's gonna be a lot of topics I'm gonna be trying to discuss on these upcoming Wired Hunt Weekly episodes. But really over the past week and a half since I've been back here at home, it's been just chaos. I've got so much to do now that I was gone. You know, it was sweet, it was great to be out there out west doing those different things, but because of that, I wasn't able to stay up on a lot of my whitetail chores. So I was up to our northern Michigan property working on putting in our first food plot up there, and that was kind of a debacle. Uh, I've been dealing with some food plot issues down here in southern Michigan. So I've been disking, spraying, I planted two days ago one of my plots. I've got another plot that's an overgrown mess that I still need to figure out. Um, I've got a bunch of tree stands to move. I'm going to Ohio in a couple days to work on our property down there, check cameras, move cameras, check tree stands. Um, so lots and lots to do, lots of stuff to cover. And then on top of all of that, in two weeks, I leave for Montana again for an early season whitetail hunt. So no rest for the weary, but I can't complain. I suppose it's going to be some fun stuff. That all said, today what I wanted to do was actually go through some kind of Q&A type of thing here. I get tons and tons and tons of emails asking various deer hunting questions, and I've tried to start answering some of those through our podcast, the 100% Wild Podcast, but we're only able to answer one question every couple weeks, so there's still lots more I want to get to. So what I thought I'd do today is take a stab at four different questions that were emailed to me and answer them here on this video episode. So I think we should stop beating around the bush, and I'm going to tackle these questions. So the first one comes from Eric, and Eric asks, um, so he says he's been starting to listen to some of the older episodes of the Wired Hunt podcast, and he heard us talking about Nose Jammer. So he asks, do you use other scent covers on your clothes at the same time, stuff like Sunaway or anything like that, and then use Nose Jammer as well, or just Nose Jammer? So yes, I do use a number of other scent control products in addition to Nose Jammer. So let me just walk you through my whole kind of scent control uh, at least product regimen. So first and foremost, I wash all my clothing in, eh, amateur move there with the phone on. <laughs> so I wash all of my clothes in scent-free detergent. Then I make sure to store all those clothes somewhere they're gonna stay scent-free. Um, then when I head out to the field, I spray down with a scent eliminating spray. I personally do use Scent Away, which is the Hunter Specialties' scent spray. Um, I've used their uh, wash, their body wash for scent-free showers as well. I do that too. Um, but then when I'm actually about to go out in the field, that's when I use nose jammer. So I spray that nose jammer scent on the bottoms of my boots, and then I walk out to my tree stand or my blind or whatever, and then I spray it wherever I'm hunting, on that tree or on the blind. And finally then, I also use an Ozonics unit. So I'm using a lot of stuff. Um, I like to say I'm not good enough hunter not to use some of these things to help minimize that scent. I'm always trying to do everything I possibly can. So what Nose Jammer does is that it essentially blocks or kind of jams up the olfactory system of a deer. So it kind of overwhelms a deer's nose. They hit this Nose Jammer scent and it's just so strong with stimulus that it blocks everything out, including human odor. And I really have seen it work very well. I, I'm really not big on gimmicky products. I, I honestly am not that big on gear in general. There's a few core things I really believe in and I use religiously. Otherwise, in the, in the long run, I think it really comes down to how you hunt, the strategies you use, your mindset, how much work you put into it. But there are a few things I really believe in. And this one, this is something that I have a hard time arguing with after I've seen some of these things work out as well as they have. So Nose Jammer, I definitely use. And then that Ozonix unit. Really, it's unbelievable. I, long before I ever used Nose Jammer, Ozonics was helping me make a big difference. This works as, it essentially creates ozone, which drops down over your scent stream. So my scent's blowing this way, the ozone's on top of me, it drops down, hits my scent, and ozone molecules bind with that human scent molecule and it changes essentially what that molecule is so that when a deer smells that, it's different. It doesn't smell like human odor. It's something they're not aware of. They can't quite figure it out. So between those two tools, I've put myself in really remarkable position for a lot of deer where 
these deer should be smelling me. They're straight downwind and they just don't. You know, last year in Iowa, I had 30, 40 deer walk straight downwind to me, including two different shooter bucks, mature bucks, and uh, never winded me, never freaked out. So there's been a lot of eye-opening experiences like that that have helped me, you know, get away with some things that probably you shouldn't typically. So that's what I'm using from a scent control standpoint. That's how I'm using Nose Jammer. PJ asks, here's our next question. PJ is taking a friend on a public land hunt in Kentucky on opening weekend. And he's hunting a wildlife management area. And he's been hearing myself and Dan Infault and others talk about ways of hunting these early season bucks, specifically with locating bedding areas. So he asks, he's having a hard time locating potential bedding areas just from looking at online maps. So do you have any tips or what to look for when it comes to finding bedding areas on maps? It's a great question. It's an important thing to do, especially when you're trying to scout out a new property. Um, ideally, what you'd want to do is, is do some map scouting first. Identify those likely areas where you think bedding areas would be, both doe and buck bedding areas, and then go out there in the late winter or early spring, check those spots out, try to verify whether or not they really are bedding areas. But in this case, you know, hunting season is almost upon us, so maybe he's not gonna have a chance to actually go there and scout these places in person. So what can you do just from a map standpoint? Well, I would try to look at a map that includes both an aerial view and a topographic view. Um, there's lots of tools for that. You can get a print, you can get a printed map, you can get an online map, um, but find some kind of map that shows those two types of features, cover and topography. You need to be able to see where there's you know, certain types of brush, certain types of trees, certain types of cover, but then you also need to be able to see those topographic lines that show you where ridges, where saddle is, where points are, and all those different things. So find whatever tool it is you want to use online if that's what you're doing to look at this kind of stuff. And I would focus on a couple different types of terrain and cover features where there's most likely going to be bedding areas. So if you're in Kentucky, I'm gonna assume that there's some type of topography, lots of hills in Kentucky, ridges, stuff like that. It's a relatively rugged country from what I've seen and heard. So if that's the case, you're probably gonna see a lot of bedding areas on those ridges. Lots of times bucks and does really gonna be bedding along these ridges. About eh, two thirds of the way up seems to be that kind of consistent place where deer like to be set up and they're gonna bed with the wind, typically at least they're gonna blow, have that wind blowing over their heads so they can smell what's behind them and then they can look out over the valley in front of them. Now does are gonna be bedded on those ridges while the bucks are typically gonna be bedded out on little knobs or points off of those ridges. So take a look at the maps, find a topo map or a map that includes topographic information so you can see where those ridges are, you can see where the points and the knobs are, um, and if you're not familiar with how to read that kind of map, we've got a number of other resources on Wired to Hunt. Just search maps, using maps and stuff. There's, there's a lot of good stuff that uh, will kind of guide you in how to use maps to find those ridges, to find the points, to find the knobs. Those are almost always going to be some of the best spots for a deer to be bedded. On top of that, if you can find really good cover coinciding with those ridge lines and points, that's again going to be a spot that you want to kind of focus your efforts on. Um, if you're not in areas of hilly country, if it's flat land, just flat farmland or something, then you're typically going to be looking for really, really thick cover. In most cases, mature bucks are going to try to be in the thickest, nastiest stuff away from human pressure. That's an overgeneralization, but when you're looking on maps, that's a great place to start. All right. Next question is from a Dan. And Dan asks, he was wondering if I could cover when I like to hunt, you know, mornings or afternoons, based on the time of year, pre-rut, post-rut, et cetera. What are my personal preferences? So, great question. Um, and I definitely have certain times of year I prefer mornings, certain times of year I prefer afternoons, certain times of the year I hunt all day. So I'll kind of walk you through my year. So, early season. I do not hunt mornings, almost as a rule. Occasionally I might, but I very rarely hunt mornings in the early season, all the way till late October. And I do that because in most cases, at least here in Michigan where I hunt a lot, where there's a lot of hunting pressure, it's really easy to spook deer in the morning when you're trying to get into your tree stand. Now yes, if you've got a great access route that allows you to come in through the thick cover while deer are feeding out in the fields and you can get into those bedding areas or near bedding area and catch deer coming back, that might work. But lots of times, at least where I hunt, those most mature bucks, they're usually getting back to their beds really early in the morning. Sometimes, most times really, before daylight. 
So even if you get in the right way, if you're coming in there even a half hour before daylight or something, there's still a good chance you can spook that buck when you try to go into that type of area for a morning hunt. And if you don't do that, if you're just walking across a food source in the morning, well, you're really screwing things up. And the issue is that if you do that once or twice, you're really going to educate those deer, which means that they're not going to be moving during daylight in the future when you hunt them during an evening hunt when maybe you typically would see those deer moving during daylight. So it's just, for me, too much of a risk. There's a low odds time to possibly see deer moving in daylight, but high odds of risk. So I avoid morning hunts, I focus on those evenings. Evenings in the early and mid season are really when you're typically gonna see the best evening movement or the best daylight movement, and it's safer getting into those trees to your blind or your tree stand or whatever, because those deer are bedded. So that's what I'm doing until about late October. But once you get to that October 25th, 6th, 7th, somewhere around there, you're gonna start seeing those bucks get a little feisty, starting to nose around some does, the pre-ruts coming on. So you can start to see that daylight activity in the morning, and then it's worth going in there for those morning hunts. I love mornings from that time period on all the way through November as you go through those various rut phases across you know, most parts of the country. You're going to see that early, moving, early morning movement, you're going to see the mid-morning movement, and really once November 1st hits, the 1st through like eh, you know, the 25th, somewhere around there, I'm hunting all day. Every day I'm hunting, if possible, I'm going to hunt the entire day because yeah, you're going to have morning movement, but there's also going to be that midday movement that doesn't happen quite as often. But still, it definitely happens, and at least for me, you know, I spend so much time all throughout the year preparing, trying to put myself in a position to kill a mature buck. Why would I you know, knowingly just choose not to be out there during a time when it's possible? And uh, I, I just, I have a hard time sleeping at night if I know that I didn't do everything I possibly could. So November 1 through really almost all of November, if I can, I try to hunt all day. Then, let's fast forward into late season, once you get into December or January, now the deer are back on somewhat similar patterns to what they were earlier in the year, bed to feed, right? They bed and then they find whatever the best food source at that time is and they come out and feed. Again, just like the early season, I'm avoiding those mornings for the exact same reasons. They typically are going to be active during daylight in the evenings anyways, and they're typically going to be coming back in the mornings early. So they're easiest spook in the morning, easier to hunt in the evening. So I'm going to be playing it safe hunting those evenings and not screwing things up by trying to push in there in the mornings too often. So that's what I do from a timing standpoint throughout most of the year. And finally, we've got a question from John. John says he's looking to hunt some public land that's surrounded by cornfields. There's even a cornfield on the public land. I've walked the area and there's thick bedding areas there with trails leading in and out of them. My question is, will the deer bed in the standing corn and remain there until it's harvested? If so, will that make it impossible to encounter any deer? Would I just be better off hunting near bean fields until the standing corn's been harvested? Good question, John. Lots of people have this type of situation. I've encountered the situation a lot. Standing corn, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And I'll say, I've got a couple thoughts. First, standing corn definitely does become a bedding area for some deer, so yes, you might have some situations like that where deer are spending a lot of their time in the corn and not coming out as often, which can be a tough thing. Uh, you know, especially, you know, during the rut when you're expecting deer to be chasing around in the timber and stuff, if you have a ton of standing corn around you, yeah, you're probably gonna see a little bit less activity because so much of that is in the corn jungle. But it's not a 100% thing. Like they are not always in the corn. They are not never going to come out of the corn. So you can definitely still have success around standing corn because A, it does provide great cover. So you're gonna hold deer in that area. That's a good thing. It's great food. So again, helping you hold those deer in the area. So if you hunt the edges of that corn or nearby or you know between the corn and these other bedding areas you found, you can definitely still have success. I love, if you ever find a finger of timber that goes into a cornfield um, or anything like that, that can be a great spot to intercept deer. Um, scrapes, you know, lots of times daytime activity on scrapes is pretty minimal, but if you've got a scrape that's right along a standing cornfield and there's that thin, you know, thin pathway between the corn and the timber, that can be one of those areas that deer feel pretty comfortable moving through during daylight. I've seen a ton of daylight activity in scrapes or in camera photos on scrapes in that type of situation. So if you can find that kind of deal, that can be a spot worth hunting. Um, just a few years ago, I killed a really nice buck on the morning of November 5th or 6th, I think. He came out of a standing cornfield 
and walked into this kind of patch of CRP I was hunting that was on one of these fingers that goes out into that cornfield. So definitely don't give up on that area. You can most certainly see deer, even with the standing corn. It's gonna keep deer in the area. And then whenever that corn is harvested, well, yeah, a lot more of that activity is gonna push into the timber. And then, you know, you've got that going for you too. So don't shy away from the standing corn fields. They can be great in their own ways and even better, of course, when they're harvested, but plenty of opportunity to have. So that is, uh, that's all I'm gonna do here for a quick Q&A session here. Hopefully some of that stuff was helpful in the coming days and weeks. Like I mentioned, I've got Ohio trail cameras and prep down there. I'm finishing up some food plots, gonna be doing some stand adjustments and tweaks. So I'm gonna try to cover some of that on future episodes. So keep an eye out for that. And then two weeks from now, the, uh, the Montana hunt begins. So exciting stuff to come.